Welcome to the investor track of the World Stem Cell Summit. This next session is presented by Dynamic Star, a successful New York developer. The emerging market for facilities and real estate for regenerative medicine and the life sciences. We could call it the exploding market. This is a very unique session for a World Stem Cell Summit or any life sciences meeting. But we all have to know that we're not going to be able to continue to work out of spare bedrooms because of the pandemic. And no one is going to be manufacturing cells from their home. There has to be a place. And there's no better way to present that with the leading experts in the field. So we are going to present to you today uh, experts in architecture and facilities, uh, the real estate market itself, and the developer point of view, and a great case study from the New York Stem Cell Foundation. For, uh, I want to introduce first uh, the vice president of CBRE, Alessio Trapino. He is the vice president of the New York Life Science Team in Midtown, Midtown Manhattan. Uh, he will provide a worldview of real estate development emerging in the field. Uh, also, uh, the director of development of Dynamic Star, the legendary Brad Saxon, who's a leading figure in New York real estate development, finance, and management. Why is Dynamic Star focused on the life sciences, indeed on regenerative medicine? Also presenting today, presenting a case study for us from the city of New York is Jeff Wallerstein. Jeff is the CFO of the New York Stem Cell Foundation, very well known group and organization to those that have attended the World Stem Cell Summit. It's a pioneering foundation that is building and expanding its laboratories in Manhattan and their journey is a journey that we should all pay attention to. Our speakers today, we are going to present uh, two leading architects of indeed perhaps the preeminent global architecture firm working in the life sciences and facilities. That of course is Perkins Eastman. Uh, presenting for Perkins Eastman to explain this detailed and very important world of facilities is uh, Stephen Steve Gifford, principal of science and technology practice of Perkins Eastman, uh, who has directed a wide range of projects through programming, master planning, and design. Also presenting today is Shafali Reish Shaduri. Uh, Shafali is the associate practice leader and senior associate for the life sciences at Perkins Eastman. This is going to be a very informative session and something that you're not gonna hear anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, Shivali uh, and I are going to talk about this exciting age that we live in. We call it the age of life science. So, uh, I've devoted my career to the design of uh, science and technology buildings. And this is a particularly interesting era where uh, the uh, private research buildings for biotech companies, large pharmaceuticals, that world is merging with the university research world. And we have the pleasure of designing uh, uh, both individual facilities for those kinds of clients, but also uh, merged facilities. And developers are actually building more and more actual university research buildings for the universities. Hi, everyone. I'm Shafali Raichaudhry. Thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Steve. I'm the Senior Associate and Associate Practice Area Leader for Science and Technology at Perkins Eastman. Uh, my background has always been public and private institutional projects, um, as well as life science facilities. So we're very excited to be here. So today, Shivali and I are going to quickly go through 
the the considerations that one needs to look at in in uh, choosing development sites uh, for science and technology projects, choosing the right kind of existing buildings to reimagine into science projects or creating new buildings. So we're going to cover challenges and opportunities, design and technical criteria, and then we're going to look at the scales of a few other. Uh, uh, various projects in the industry. So there are lots of components that go into these facilities. Uh, uh, many projects start with master plannings, both of university campuses and science parks, and then an exploration of the design of uh, significant buildings for corporations. Uh, pharmaceuticals, universities, startup companies. Uh, these buildings, regardless of whether they're new or reimagined, require significant core facilities. Uh, Shivali is going to go into some of the design and technical criteria that goes into those uh, uh, high tech spaces. And then, of course, as I mentioned, developers are also beginning to build buildings for universities or buildings that combine uh, private research and universities. Uh, and uh, the lab space is not only just wet experimental lab space, you'll find a lot of um, physical instrumentation, physical uh, sciences. Uh, also come into play in life sciences and bioengineering is a huge growth area for uh, developers and scientists. Uh, so many of our master plans that we do for universities, in fact, I would say all of them involve creating new gateway buildings to the campuses, but, but uh, very, very particularly involve uh, ways that the university researchers can interface with uh, biotechnology companies. Uh, sometimes the land is on the university campus uh, to be developed for private research and other times it's adjacent, but uh, all major research universities need that kind of connection with uh, private research companies. And this is just a range of different life science centers. We're mainly gonna be talking about New York City today, but obviously all over North America, there are development opportunities. Many of those locations don't, don't have the natural benefits uh, that will help in, uh, New York City create a, a true vibrant hub for biotechnology. So, we're going to talk about uh, not just interna international opportunities, but challenges and opportunities. Next slide. So uh, uh, when we're helping uh, our clients uh, choose uh, the best possible sites for development for life science or, or analyzing existing buildings that sometimes they were designed for uh, science, but uh, designed many, many years ago and, and they don't really uh, support modern uh, experimental research. So what we see what we see in old facilities or or even companies and institutions that are gravitating to new ways of doing research, right now they're kind of stuck in research silos. There's not good interdisciplinary research. Uh, the buildings are kind of dark, they're not transparent uh, and and they have, really no space for the researchers to collaborate outside of the laboratories. Next slide. So uh, the future of research is uh, just the opposite of that. It's to break down silos, it's to create collaborative environments, it's to respond to the fact that more and more of the research is, is being done uh, computationally. Uh, requiring dry space, not wet space, uh, and these, and we need to recognize that researchers work long hours. So we need to create uh, great in uh, you know, twenty-four hour environments for them. Next slide. 
So the evolution of research space, if you go back a few decades, you would walk into a research facility. It was mostly general uh, wet bench laboratory space, but as the years have evolved, uh, uh, specialty equipment becomes more and more important to, to support the research. So we design a large part, ever increasing part of the research facilities are support labs uh, with special environmental requirements, a lot more office space, computational research space, and most importantly, what we call the collaborative core. Uh, it really is really a place uh, where discovery can happen between disciplines and uh, break down the silos. So uh, uh, designing for that future of research is really exciting for us because it, it involves configuring whole buildings and creating research neighborhoods that are rich with their interdisciplinary research. We like to create hubs of activity uh, for the researchers to gather and, and, and places for them to recharge even when they're outside of their uh, laboratory environments. Next slide. So I'll be talking a little bit about the design and technical criteria for life science facilities. And when looking at existing facilities, we often start with the basic question of building analysis. Um, you know, the graphics on the right really sort of looks at useful life for building components. How much can you save and how much can you reuse? What is the value of existing components? And largely, I would say there are three uh, important components of an existing building that we take into consideration. Uh, building structure, the um, outside exterior skin, the mechanical electrical plumbing components. And then I think the fourth one being sort of fit out, which often also plays an important role. And in our analysis, we try to um, see what are some of the tangible benefits, both in, both in terms of cost implications, as well as efficiencies. So I'll be walking you through some typical lab design standards. Um, as Steve mentioned, you know, with the collaborative core, we do see 60% um, lab to 40% office ratio. That has actually started um, changing a bit more to 50-50 or even 40-60, especially in terms of dry labs and computational research spaces. I would say the average uh, lab space standards kind of varies, which is sort of a little bit higher for wet research labs, going down to about 100 um, assignable square feet for dry labs and computational spaces. But as Steve mentioned, you know, something that's key is common spaces. We all know that discovery often happens outside of typical research areas and lab environments. And to be able to provide for collaboration areas for exchange of thoughts and ideas is very important to life science and biotech spaces. Flexibility and adaptability is key and paramount. There's often changes as, you know, the amount of uh, dry to wet lab changes. So that really sort of also plays an important factor in design of life science spaces. A few key uh, design and technical criteria to consider. The one that comes up sort of foremost is zoning. You know, this can really inhibit or prevent lab occupancy and use changes. So our recommendation is to first really sort of dive into how much hazardous mater material can be stored. What can the facility be used for? Uh, oftentimes there are um, requirements related to dictating, can we put mechanical units on top of the building? So we would recommend sort of zoning being the topmost or the foremost um, design and technical criteria. Another aspect comes into play regarding efficiency is the floor plate size. In our experience, we would say about 20,000 GSF plus would be would start to become more of an efficient um, development for a life science, small life science facility. Uh, other physical aspects that come into play are clear height. Um, you know, lab facilities often require uh, a higher above ceiling space for exhausting and for fume hose, et cetera. So that's an important criteria, as well as structure. The loading capacity is a little bit different from sort of your typical medical office or office building. Um, I would say that 100 pounds per square foot is the absolute minimum. Uh, often the live load capacity needs to be higher than that. And really the column spacing is important because you know, it needs to accommodate uh, the various lab modules, which are often around 10 and a half to 11 foot. Um, and that, you know, so that's important. 
Um, another important criteria as we look at mechanical, electrical, and plumbing is having the ability to accommodate vertical shafts and chases to really account for sort of higher outdoor air needs uh, through mechanical ventilation for some of the equipment. Um, there is also an augmented um, requirement for electrical to support some of these uh, mechanical requirements, but also really sort of emergency power, and that's important as well. Uh, we also should be looking at DI and RO water requirement in terms of plumbing, as well as disposal of lab waste, etc. So I want to uh, highlight this sort of this diagrammatic section on the right, which is really a high level building assessment for a life science use. We analyze the best approach to accommodating life science program within an existing building and identifying um, issues and constraints related to the design and technical criteria that I just went over in order to reposition this existing building, which was initially a medical office building for life science use. A few other important design and technical criteria that I wanna to touch on is acoustics, air quality, and vibration. And these become important for specialized labs you know, vibration from mechanical equipments, refrigeration, as well as Steve, uh, street environments can become um, important to evaluate and as they can affect uh, sensitive lab equipment. Um, and then really sort of getting into fire separation zones with regards to both um, local codes and compliance uh, is key really to establish, you know, lab units and control areas. Um, the takeaway from this slide that I want to leave you with is sort of um, really dictating what is the percentage of chemical storage that we can have, how many lab units that we, we can have, as well as sort of the, the vertical separations that are needed so that, you know, things like mechanical ductwork are not crossing through control areas. Typically, um, we see this um, that as you move above in the building, above level three or higher, there is a decreased amount of chemical storage that's typically um, allowed for by IBC and as well as NFPA. So now Steve will talk about um, sort of one of the case studies uh, looking at, we'll look at sort of a range of two case studies of different scales. Um, and I'll let Steve talk about sort of the first one. So later in the presentation, Brad Zaxton will present uh, a few of these examples on the left that uh, we've helped Brad design for New York City. Uh, they are particularly large developments that involve mixed use and, and significant science elements. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a one minute story about the Alexander Center for Life Science. Uh, Perkins Eastman of the a pleasure of creating the original master plan. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, for the East River Science Park that led to uh, really the first major successful biotech hub in the city. Uh, next slide. It is 1.2 million, actually more than 1.2 million square feet of life science space. Uh, these, these, uh, this rendering and plans are the original master plan that uh, was created. This was a desolate piece of land, actually in a very interesting and important neighborhood with Bellevue Hospital, NYU Medical School, and a vibrant community. But the actual site was uh, really quite desolate. So this became a great opportunity for the city to select a developer, which turned out to be Alexandria Real Estate and, and to create a, a true prime site for biotechnology in the city. Next slide. So what was in, important in this whole concept, uh, and we, our team designed the core and shell for the first two major towers. Uh, it is a very vertical uh, development given the land that was available. Uh, but it was also a complete ecosystem that was designed for major pharmaceuticals and biotech companies, mid-sized companies, startups that could, could literally rent uh, benches in what Alexandria calls their science hotel. But it was a real ecosystem, 24 hour day system where ca with cafes, restaurants and even venture capitalist offices. Now designing very tall research buildings 
uh, have some challenges uh, developing a very efficient core for these buildings is essential to provide uh, flexible laboratory space for the remainder of the space. And that's what we created there at East River Science Park. And so the last slide I'll talk to you is uh, just uh, a collage of images showing this rich environment, both outside space that's uh, accessible to the community, uh, so that the celebration of science can be shared by all informal uh, uh, cafes, modern research space. So uh, from this project, uh, Brad will talk about other developments. Shafali will talk about a development in, in um, northern Manhattan. But uh, from this project grew many different, like a hub and a spoke system around the city, taking advantage of the rich opportunities that New York City has. Thanks, Steve. So here's one other case study, but really sort of very different in terms of scale, cost point, and as Steve mentioned, location. Um, so this is a conversion from a warehouse um, building to um, from an industrial use to business use for, you know, startup, almost startup biotech companies. And this is located in the, the northern portion of Manhattan, um, in Manhattanville. Um, so it does have the benefit of have, being very close to Columbia, Manhattanville, and also, you know, the, the main campus. But what this provides in terms of location is a, is a very different price point. Um, and it's great for New York City because, you know, it starts to cater to sort of a variation of life science tenants as it's not so expensive as perhaps um, in terms of the rentable square footage for sort of the first case study that Steve mentioned. Um, so Perkins Eastman sort of did a feasibility study and evaluated um, the Mink building for the use of uh, potential bioscience tenants. And uh, what you see on the slide is a fit out for one of the tenants um, in terms of labs, uh, write up space shown in orange, as well as sort of certain collaboration uh, areas shown in green. Um, you know, the key aspects that we talked about related to design and technical criteria were still used and analyzed here. Um, the infrastructure was fit out to accommodate for the rest of the fit out for the Mink building. And I think some of the key design criteria that was used was uh, visual access between labs, natural light coming into the space, providing flexibility and adaptable space. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And I have a couple of questions. I'm imagining that knocking on the Perkins Eastman door are developers of shopping malls, owners of malls, big Manhattan, empty office, sp office space. And everyone looks, all of the owners are thinking about the nice rents that might come in from uh, if they can only convert their property. Are they uh, coming in with the, the knowledge that they might have to build a, a GMP facility um, what is it like to be in your shoes right now with the real estate market as it is? Well, we're, we're super excited. As uh, Shivali and I said at the beginning of the presentation, we think this is the age of life science. I, I actually think our whole culture is much more appreciative given recent events of the importance of uh, scientific discovery, diagnostic testing. So uh, a lot of office space and residential space has been built in New York City uh, and we see a great need, but also a great opportunity for developers to develop uh, either, either space that's no longer needed for offices or just, or just uh, the wealth of sites that are around the city. I think New York City is so lucky to have, uh, you know, prime real estate in the center of Manhattan, but uh, the, the full spectrum of different kinds of sites and that allow developers to provide different price points for um, uh, 
for their tenants. Uh, you know, early startup companies don't have nearly as much money as pharmaceuticals, so they're looking for lower, more manageable rents. And I think uh, Shivali may uh, want to add to this, but I know Ale Alessio and Brad will talk a lot about that in a few minutes about the different neighborhoods in New York and development opportunities. Yeah, so I, I, could you explain to the audience a bit more about Perkins Eastman itself, the total scope of your offices and especially uh, your division in, uh, that's focused on the life sciences? Well, we, uh, uh, Shafali and I have a great team of architects designing uh, laboratory facilities of all the kinds we just talked about today. But uh, we also have wonderful colleagues who are leaders in urban design and education facilities and workplace strategies. So uh, I think Shivali and I and our team are fascinated with projects that blend uh, all, all those design challenges. Uh, and uh, the more complex the project is actually, the more fun it is to work on. I wanna thank you both so much. Shafali. If I may add to that. Um, so for our firm, convergence is key. We often see workplace and um, science and technology come together as well as healthcare, education. So I think Perkins Eastman is able to bring a, a platform of um, very, um, uh, you know, sort of good uh, leaders and be able to have thought leadership come together um, on a singular platform and, you know, sort of look at all these various um, sectors together. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Bernie. For the next part of our session, I'm very pleased to present Brad Zaxson, who is the Director of Development of Dynamic Star, and also Alessio Trapiano, who's the Vice President at CBRE and uh, the Vice President of the New York City Life Science Team in Midtown Manhattan. They're gonna be providing an overview, overview of the overall real estate market and also with a focus on New York as our case study. They will be followed by Jeff Wallerstein. Jeff, of course, is the CFO of the New York Stem Cell Foundation and the wonderful work they're doing and the laboratories that they're building in Manhattan. So let me turn it over to you, Brad. Thank you, Bernie. I just wanted to say thank you, Bernie and the conference for inviting us back and giving us an opportunity to discuss life science in New York City. Let me begin by talking a little bit about myself and our company. My name is Brad Zaxson. I'm the Director of Development at Dynamic Star. We're a full service real estate development company. We specialize in mixed use, transit oriented, large scale developments. I have 30 years of experience in all types of development in New York City. And I am the co-founder of Dynamic Star with my partner, Gary Siegel. Why New York City for life science? Throughout its history, New York City has always found ways to reinvent itself. New York City began as a trading post, grew to world financial, real estate, and media capital. The capacity for the transformation and ability to adapt, innovate, and recover is embedded in New York City's DNA. From the terror attacks of 9-11 to the financial crisis of 2008, to the destruction of Hurricane Sandy in 212, and now COVID-19 pandemic. Every time it's emerged bigger, stronger, and better. This pandemic will be no exception. Currently, New York ranks eighth among US life science clusters by square footage. No city is better positioned. We have all the ingredients to become a global hub for this industry. Even after the pandemic, Many companies are investing in life science and in our city. Deerfield Management, Teutonic Partners, Sid Properties, Silverstein Properties, also Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, TikTok have all doubled down on our town. Building blocks, talent, institute, and infrastructure. 
Our people are our strength. New York City attracts the best and the brightest. Diverse, educated, hardworking is the spirit of New York, our institutions. The largest research-based academic medical centers in the nation, one of the most extensive healthcare system in the nation. An integrated network of transportation infrastructure, three major highways. We have public, private, capital sources, we are Wall Street. We have a government that supports us. This town works like a public-private partnership. We get things done. I would like to introduce you to Alessio to discuss some of the details of our incentives and the real estate market. Alessio. Thanks, Brad, I appreciate it. Uh, um, hi everyone, Alessio Tropiano, CBRE, um, Vice President of the Life Science Division here in New York. Um, I think it's probably pertinent to, to start out and just look at, um, you know, what are the successful, the elements for a successful ecosystem, not just in New York, but um, really any, any marketplace, any ecosystem around the country, uh, and just focus on New York as, as our case study. Um, so something that I think my team and I in New York have done a really good job thus far the past five, six years we've been working in the life science industry in New York City um, is kind of bring all of these different pieces together. Um, so the venture capital, the academic and healthcare institutions in New York, the economic development, um, the development professional services, which includes you know, people like myself at CBRE, but also the incubators and service providers. Um, so bringing all of these parts and pieces together is what makes a very successful ecosystem. So you've got the venture capital funding and the NIH funding, um, which flows into the incubator companies and the smaller stage companies that are coming out of the academic and healthcare institutions. And then you have the service providers, the Ms. Pros, the Charles Rivers, um, the Explora Bio Labs, um, and the folks that help service those service providers, the development professionals like myself or um, Perkins and Will, an architecture firm, JBNB, a, um, uh, an engineering firm. And then that helps draw in through the help of the economic development corporations like New York Bio, the New York EDC, um, LifeSci NYC, who also sponsor the incubators, these large pharma, pharmas and industry biotechs. So the Eli Lilly's, the Johnson & Johnson's, the Bears of the world. Um, and what that leads to is a extremely robust and, and growing ecosystem. So if we can go to the next slide here. So when you look at the funding activity, uh, the industry overview in New York, where we can take a step back for a second and just look at the funding activity uh, for 2020 um, in the US. US life science venture capital firms themselves raised a record amount of almost $17 billion. Um, and that is to go directly towards early and growing, early stage and growing life science companies. Um, New York City itself, received a record amount of funding, um, about 907 million. Um, currently, New York State ranks third behind uh, just Massachusetts and California in total VC funding. Um, and then you step down to the NIH funding um, and New York City received a record $2.9 billion um, in 2020 of NIH funding. And what's really, really interesting about New York City is that the funding gap between New York City and, and the Boston Cambridge market, the leading life science ecosystem and cluster in the world, um, that gap has contracted from $730 million in 2011 to 370 million in 2016. Last year was just $22 million. Um, and when you look at what's going on in Congress right now and what President Biden is proposing with the NIH funding, um, increasing it to 21, 22% year over year. Imagine what something like that can do to a city like New York City um, or an ecosystem in a market like New York City that's already receiving $2.9 billion. Um, increasing that amount will have a huge impact, not just on the early stage companies, but also on the employment numbers in New York, which is really what a lot of these um, administrations like the de Blasio administration and Governor Cuomo are very focused on job creation. Um, you look at what employment in New York has done just over the last few years, and it's increased nine to 10% year over year in New York City. And these are all very good paying jobs. Um, I think the average 
salary for a, a life science employee in New York City last year was about $140,000. Um, and on average, year, year over year, the city has attracted about 54, 55 new life science companies since 2016. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. Yeah, so on the heels of the $500 million life science initiative um, in New York State's $650 million commitment, the building life science industry throughout the city, the state, uh, Mayor de Blasio actually recently announced um, his new budget, which included $300 million to fund the expansion of the life science industry in New York. Um, that on top of the increased NIH funding, the city has continued to make investments to attract life science companies and incentivize industry growth. A lot of the um, city incentives, you know, such as the REIT program, the Excelsior job program, and, and tax benefits, IDA tax benefits, are there to almost help subsidize the amount of space that goes into, or the amount of space that's built in New York City. Uh, so those tax abatements go a long way uh, in helping reduce the cost for, for tenants to get passed through. So if we go to the next slide. So this is the current uh, landscape of the market in New York. You can see how the clusters are evolving. Um, we look at Manhattan almost as, as its own cluster with little nodes. So up on the Upper West Side, you've got Launch Labs up by Columbia, um, a new development, or the Tasty Labs, excuse me, uh, in, in West Harlem right next to Columbia. That's about a 350,000 foot ground up purpose built life science building uh, being built by Janus Property Co and, and JP Morgan um, right next to Columbia. And then you go a little bit further south, 125 West End um, is being developed, a completely new building um, stripped down to the structural steel. Um, that's gonna be a 400,000 foot development, but Deconic Partners and Nuveen. And then Himmel and Marengoff Properties on 57th Street. Um, where the Tisch MS Center is located, along with, uh, with LabCorp. Um, and then a little bit further south, where, where Jeff Wallerstein and, and his folks are located, New York Stem Cell Foundation, um, another 350,000 foot property being converted um, to life science use. So what's happening in New York and what you can see is, is a rush to built space, ready to go space. And it's something that's been missing in the industry or in the ecosystem for a long time now. Um, when you compare it to a Boston, Cambridge or a San Francisco or San Diego, there is a huge lack of built, ready to go space that companies coming out in incubators can move into on a relatively short time period. Historically, New York and New York City owners um, have waited for the tenant to sign a lease until they actually start building the space. What you're seeing now with the 125s, the 619 West 54s of the world, um, are companies coming out of these incubators, J Labs and Bio Labs, um, down on, on in Hudson Square, need space, you know, in the next three months, in the next six months, and and owners like Taconic Partners or Deerfield um, at 345 Park Avenue South um, are offering that to them, and with that, they're able to get in much earlier, sign deals that are relatively shorter term, seven to 10 years, um, but it opens up a whole new landscape for these companies to grow into. If we can go to the next slide. And what you can see that leading to is a huge development pipeline in New York City. So right now there's about a million 700,000 square feet of existing lab space in New York. Over the next 10 years, that's gonna increase about 3.8 million square feet. Uh, to just over 5 million feet. And a lot of this, not all of it, but a lot of it is that built ready to go space that helps attract the earlier stage companies coming out of the incubators and gives them a place to go. No longer do these companies have to move to New Jersey or pick up shop and move to places like Boston or Philadelphia or across the coast to San Francisco, San Diego. Um, they're able to stay in New York where the IP has been generated, you know, through the nine academic medical institutions that are in the city um, and they're able to grow in the city. And that brings in more revenue for the city that brings in more employment um, and very good paying jobs. And the city is really here to support it. 
um, through these IDA tax benefits, through the partnership for New York City. Um, it's really something that they're trying to push and, and, and push not only in Manhattan, but also into the outer boroughs. If we go to the next slide. So what you can see here is Manhattan on the left side here. Um, there's a lot of development happening with new life science properties, most of them conversions, some of them ground up, uh, but the vast majority majority are conversions. Um, and you're also seeing a development push in Long Island City, um, in the Bronx, and in, in West Harlem. Um, and I know Dynamic Star has properties both in Long Island City, um, the Bronx, and a little bit further out in the Bronx, closer to East Harlem. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. Long Island City and the boroughs, they offer a lower land cost than most of Manhattan, um, which in of itself translates into lower, lower rents for tenants. Um, there is a lot of stock of more industrial manufacturing buildings and development sites that are much more appropriately zoned um, for life science than, than in places in Manhattan and your opportunity costs are much lower. Um, so instead of developing a high rise residential unit or um, a hotel, which normally wouldn't be your first go to move in, in a place like on Long Island City, redeveloping something into a life science property offers a lot more um, opportunity than what you would get in Manhattan. Long Island City, only you know one or two subway stops away from Grand Central Terminal in New York, which is really the heart of New York City. You can be there in about seven and a half minutes. Um, at the, that'll probably be the longest. Um, and it's a really fast growing neighborhood. There is a ton of residential development going, going on over there. Um, retail office, it's a real 24 seven area of New York um, and offers a lot of opportunity for live work play. So if we go to the next slide. So right now there's two main developments going on for life science um, in Long Island City. One is Inno Labs, which is King Street Properties and Goral Family Properties. Um, King Street is a Boston-based developer. They're redeveloping uh, and actually adding on to a 230,000 to making it into a 260,000 square foot lab building. It'll essentially be brand new when it's completed towards the end of the summer. Um, and they are very close to signing their first large deal there. Uh, it actually started as one of those step out graduation spaces, the pre-built lab spaces to attract the tenants um, and allow them to get in on an earlier timeline than what you would normally see. Um, and we'll have about 210,000 feet left over, but that building receiving the IDA tax benefits that the, the city and state have provided. Um, and it really offers another lower cost option than the properties that we're, we're working with, working on in Manhattan. The other one, Alexander Real Estate's um, building in also in Long Island City, Bindery Building. Um, Alexandria is the largest or second largest um, life science property owner in New York, sorry, excuse me, in the country. Um, they went ahead and converted the Bidry building and are converting about 90,000 feet there to what they call their, um, their grad, grad space. So it'll be Science Hotel um, where it's pre-built, ready to go. Tenants can almost move in you know, and bring their, their microscopes and their, their computers uh, and be up and running within a matter of weeks. They have had a ton of success there and leasing that up recently. Reopen New York, which is the city's COVID 19 testing center um, has has recently expanded there. Um, they are close to signing a deal with a uh, uh, another national vivarium operator, which will help attract more tenants into the space. Um, and have, have had major success with the pre-built ready to go lab space there. Next slide. So I think yeah, I think with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Brad Zaxon so he can speak a little bit about what's going on at 2310 Queens Plaza South, uh, a property that Dynamic Star is working on and considering for, for life science use in Long Island City. Thank you, Alessio. 
So the leveling factor, in my opinion, is the outer boroughs for New York City. And that is an available space and in pricing. And our building in Long Island City is a great example. It's in a perfect location, right across the street from eight subways on Queens Plaza South. We have over 400,000 of a brand new building being built. The base of it is a old loft building and the rest will be built on top is new, uh, but it'll be an iconic 400,000 foot building uh, that has space for wet lab, dry lab, office, amenity, conference. It'll be a well-built building, healthy new building that meets all the standards of the future. And it has a unique branding opportunity. Uh, the building had an iconic sign for many years that was there. It has an opportunity for the anchor tenant to get that sign and brand itself on the New York skyline. The building will be delivered in 2023. Next. Our Bronx sites have a lot in common. Transit, parks, waterfront, campus type, mixed use properties that specialize in live, work and learn. Bronx River Park is a perfect example of that. We have a property here that is centrally located in transit in the middle of rail, interstate and airports. Um, it's on the Bronx River, it's on Starlight Park and it is going to be delivered in 2024. There's approximately a million one square feet being developed about 700,000 will be flexible uh, space that would meet the life science industry and about 350 of support retail and apartments in the Bronx River site. It'll be delivered in approximately 2024. And our other property in the Bronx is the Holland River campus. It is a campus-like project of mixed use, 2 million point four square feet on 14 acres. We'll have approximately 700,000 flexible space to be customized for the life science industry here. Um, its location is on a major highway, interstate highway. It is on the Metro North 18 minutes from Grand Central Parkway. It's also on the waterfront and next to one of the newest state parts, Clemente Park. We'll be delivering this property in 2025. All of our properties are the leveling factor that I spoke of earlier and uh, on available space and built to suit and priced on the national basis. I think um, we would like to make an invitation for us to be your local team. If anyone wants to learn about New York, we will be available to answer questions and put you in the right direction and hopefully introduce you to the right people if you're interested in entering the New York market. That'll be our pleasure. I wanna thank you from all of us. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Alessio. Uh, this really warms my heart because we can take this type of dynamic presentation that you provided and multiply this times the world because the field of the life sciences and specifically regenerative medicine and stem cells is exploding. For our next speaker, of course, is, is uh, Jeff Wallerstein, who is the CFO of the New York Stem Cell Foundation. The New York Stem Cell Foundation is the jewel in the crown of a stem cell foundation that has started from scratch from the uh, dining room of its co-founder, Susan Solomon, and has grown to a formidable nonprofit that's actually constructed laboratories in Manhattan doing world-class research. So Jeff, please tell us a bit about the New York Stem Cell Foundation story. Thank you. Thanks, Bernie, and thanks to the organizers of this panel today to give me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute, or NYSIF as we call it. Um, as you just said, Bernie, we, we were incorporated in 2005 in New York um, to find cures and treatments for patients using stem cell technology. 
So at the New York Stem Cell Foundation, we have three main programs. We have uh, an, an extramural granting program called the Nice of Innovators, where we fund scientists all over the world to do stem cell research. The uh, person in that picture is Feng Zhang, who's one of our early innovators who invented CRISPR-Cas9 technology that you may have heard of. We also have a lot of educational programs. We are a convener. We uh, have an annual conference at Rockefeller University every year about transitional stem cell technology. We've had um, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, as a keynote speaker, Shinya Yamanaka, who invented our technology, who also uh, was a keynote. We have about 500 people attend this every year. It's at Rockefeller University. This year, it'll be October 19th to the 20th. It will be virtual, uh, again, due to the restrictions on the campus at Rockefeller. We also have other um, virtual and live, when we can, uh, panel discussions and other activities that we have. And then we also have our NYSEF Research Institute. So what happened in 2005 is uh, our founders, you mentioned Bernie, Susan Solomon is a strong patient advocate. She really believed in the power of stem cell technology. And she thought that that could have a great benefit, especially um, in a disease passionate to her type one diabetes. And so we started a lab up on 166th Street in a biotech, the Audubon Biotech Center across from Columbia University and started a small lab there. And we opened up offices on 68th and Broadway. And as we continue to expand our programs, we were starting to run out of space in the uh, Audubon Biotech, which was really set up as an incubator type space. And we started taking over other organizations and companies on the floor. And before long, we had the whole fourth floor of the building. And we were still growing and needed to um, find our next home. We wanted to combine both our offices and our labs. And we looked all over the metropolitan area for our um, new home. And this was around 2004, uh, sorry, 2014, 2015. And we were looking for a building that had a large floor plate that had high ceilings that could support the kind of infrastructure we needed to build our custom labs. And so I personally looked everywhere and uh, we found 619 West 54th Street and it fit a lot of the criteria that we were looking for, even has a park across the street that gives us nice light here in New York Stem Cell Foundation. And we were able to take the third floor. We also, this is what the floor looked like. As, and we took the third floor plus a slice of the second floor to build out our labs. I'm just gonna step back for a second and give you a little bit more background about um, the technology that we use and kind of the requirements that we need, which can help uh, understand why we selected this building. And since it is the World Stem Cell Summit, I'll talk a little bit about stem cells for a second. So we use a technology called induced pluripotent stem cells. We make these cells here at the New York Stem Cell Foundation. And they, we make these cells from people's skin or blood and we turn them into a stem cell similar to an embryonic stem cell, but they have different characteristics that make them beneficial, that we can study people who already have a disease, that we know they have a disease like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's and get a sample from them and make stem cells and what do we do with these stem cells? We, we have three main things that we can do with these stem cells. We study the cells in a dish. We study the disease. We can compare someone who's got Parkinson's with someone that's healthy to see if we can see any differences. We can use these cells as cell replacement therapy. And we can also use these human cell models to help find new drugs. Just instead of using animals or animal models, which sometimes are not always the best, we can use human cell models. And when you hear about personalized stem cell, personalized medicine, this is what people talk about, about using your own cells or to, to test why does one drug work, work well with you and maybe not on somebody else. At the New York Stem Cell Foundation, we invented this nice of global stem cell array that's a robotic platform that makes really high grade, high quality um, in a high throughput manner, these stem cells from people's blood or skin. 
And we needed to lay this out kind of an industrial setting. We need to make sure that the floor plate could hold our equipment. We needed the high ceilings, we needed big freight elevators so we can bring up our equipment. And we use this platform to make these stem cells. We can turn those stem cells into any other cell type in the body that we want to study, like a neuron or a heart cell. We can edit them. And we built up a large bank, a repository of the stem cell lines that we work with. And we were able to distribute those or a subset of those to other researchers around the world. We collaborate with everybody. We are like the Switzerland. We collaborate with all the major institutions that Alessio mentioned, the nine academics, people all over the world, Johns Hopkins University. Um, and we collaborate, we work with the NIH. Um, and so we looked, we really wanted to stay in Manhattan because we felt that we wanted to be accessible and to all our collaborators and analysis of our employees. And we felt that the West Side would be a good fit for us. And it, we're a little bit different than the biotech that maybe did a, a, a fundraising and went going off to execute on their business plan. We are a convener. We wanna be able to have people come to visit us all the time. And, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to stay in Manhattan. And so this is what we look like today. Um, we built custom labs. We built a building within a building. We put a cooling system on the roof. We built, a, we have a huge air handler on the floor. We have a boiler in the basement. We're totally independent of the building's uh, infrastructure. We were named an essential workplace by the National Eye Institute during COVID. And we built out a clean room, a GMP facility. So we can actually make clinical grade cells. You can see some of our scientists in their protective gear. Um, and our first project is in macular degeneration. We're actually going to take skin or blood from someone who has macular degeneration, turn that into a stem cell, and then turn that into a cell in the person's eye that they're losing. And we have a collaboration with Columbia University where the surgeons there are going to implant the cell in, the, in their eye. So we've uh, licensed this technology from the National Eye Institute. So over time, we started to fill out all the space. It seemed really empty when we first moved in. Oops. And uh, we grew from about 50 to 60 people to we're over 100 people right now, mainly because of our internal research program and the success of our programs and expansion of that clinical project. And uh, we have a woman reproductive cancer initiative that, that we've been expanding. We do a lot of work in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and MS and diabetes. So we approached the, we really love the building. Um, it really works well for us. Um, Deconic's been a great partner. In the beginning, it was a lot of education. They really didn't know about life sciences. And during these negotiations, we had to educate them about different chemicals we use, about fume hoods, about animals, about all kinds of different things that are relevant to a life science organization that they were used to more of a maybe tech or some other kind of industry. And they really got so involved with us that they rebranded the building after we moved in to the Hudson Research Center. And we've been a showcase for them ever since. So I approached the landlord um, during early 2020 about our, the, the we had 8,600 square feet on the second floor, about the remaining 23,000 square feet on the floor. There's actually a funeral home school there. And I uh, was wondering if they still needed all their space. It turns out they didn't, and it worked out well for all of us. And we worked out a deal and took over the rest of the second floor. We're the largest tenant in the building now, two floors, 65,000 square feet. And we're in the process of um, planning stage to build out the second floor to expand our internal research programs. That's the end of my presentation. Well, thank you, Jeff. And I want to thank the, uh, all the presenters today. This uh, title of this session was the Emerging Market for Facilities and Real Estate for Regenerative Medicine and the Life Sciences. And I can tell you that this session delivered the goods, an entirely original presentation. And as the founder of uh, 16 now, World Stem Cell Summits, this is the first session that has covered this territory that I've heard. So it's with great appreciation to all of you. And I uh, wish you the very best and I'll be humming New York, New York through the rest of the World Stem Cell Summit.
Thank you. You're always welcome, Bernie. Thanks. Thank you, Bernie.